Gordon Corman. Cutting it a little close, don't you think? Barked Coach Knapp of the West Side Automotive Chargers when Jacks and Tommy arrived in the locker room of the community center. Third Avenue was a mess, supplied Tommy, beginning to pull off his street clothes. We're headed out for the shoot-around, Knapp told them. Suit up and meet us on the floor. Jack shrugged out of his shirt and pulled his jersey over his head. He caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror. He was blue-eyed again. On his way back to pale green. On the bus, for sure, his ever-changing eyes must have been close to violet. Stress brought out the purple hues. It was embarrassing sometimes, like a mood ring you couldn't hide. Most people never noticed the changing color, yet they sensed something was different. Often they asked, Did you get a haircut? Or, Have you lost weight? Or even, Did you used to wear glasses? Being stared at was hard to get used to. Maybe that's why Tommy was an ideal best friend. He was colorblind and didn't see it. One guy who definitely saw something as the latecomers jogged out onto the court was Rodney Stedman, leading scorer on the opposing team, the sure shot pest control sharpshooters. As a, a small forward, it was Jax's assignment to cover the Gotham League MVP. They hadn't even had the tip-off yet, and already Rodney was starting staring at him. Surely, number double zero wasn't afraid of skinny Jackson Opus. Rodney was probably going to run rings around him. Coach Knapp definitely thought he would. He spent the entire week of practice encouraging Jax with such pep talks as if you can hold Stedman under 30, we've got a chance. And whatever you do, don't let him see you're scared. That kind of kid smells fear like a shark smells blood and water. Well, if there was fear to smell, Rodney already had a whiff of it, thanks to Jax's eyes, which were probably the color of grape Tootsie Pops. All at once, Jack had a, Jax had a sudden flash of seeing himself in his basketball uniform, standing at the edge of the circle, waiting the tip-off. It was just like when he'd stepped into the road to flag down the bus, a brief image of himself as he must have appeared to somebody else. Of course, with the bus, it was triggered by the fact that he was terrified of being run over. But he wasn't that frightened now, was he? Okay, he was leery of being embarrassed by Rodney in the game, but surely that didn't compare to the prospect of being squashed. Jax had been having these strange visions for several months now, too long for him to ignore his daydreams. Was he hallucinating? Maybe. But wasn't hallucination when you saw things that weren't there? He was seeing himself exactly where he was, doing exactly what he was doing. It was almost like his own eyes were receiving input from remote cameras looking back at him. Jax had heard of something called an out-of-body experience. Was that what was going on here? It was pretty weird, but according to the research he'd done on the internet, one person in every ten had them. Most often... People reported seeing their own bodies as if they were floating above themselves, and Jack, Jacks had never witnessed that. Out-of-body experiences were sometimes triggered by near-death experiences, being hit by a bus, for example. But pre-game jitters? Definitely lame. Jack scowled back at Rodney to pretend he wasn't intimidated and said, What are you looking at, man? You're scared. That's what you are. The ploy fired back. Rodney didn't look away. The league MVP understood he had very little to fear from, from the likes of Jackson Opus. The sharp whistle blast jarred him back to the court. The opening tip-off was airborne. The two centers leaped 
Bing for the ball. The sharpshooters controlled the tip, and sure enough, the pass went to Rodney. Jackson positioned himself in front of his opponent, bouncing lightly on the soles of his feet. Strangely, though, number double zero had more of his attention on the defender than on the ball. He seemed distracted, dribbling slowly and too high, well above the waistband of his shorts. Jax sliced in and slapped the ball away. He was so amazed at this accomplishment that he stuffed his toe in the hardwood and went down. Luckily, Tommy snatched up the ball and passed it cross-court to Dante Marsh, the Chargers' captain, who laid it in for the game's opening score. The Chargers were huge underdogs against the heavily favored sharpshooters, yet the game turned into a seesaw battle evenly matched with several lead changes. It wasn't that Westside Automotive was playing so well, or even that the sharpshooters were playing so badly, with one exception, Rodney Stedman. It was as if he were in slow motion, clearly distracted. He'd hit a couple shots, but by halftime, when the league MVP was normally well into double digits, he had a mere four points, and his team was clinging to a 32-31 lead. What's up with Stedman? Dante panted, gulping Gatorade. He's playing like his feet are stuck in quicksand. Yeah, point guard Gus Mayo added. We're lucky we caught him on an off day. Luck's got nothing to do with it, Tommy countered. It's my man Jax, shutting him down. Yeah, great job, Opus, Coach Knapp chimed in. You're really getting to his head. And Jax agreed. The question was, how? How was he neutralizing the player who had been making mincemeat out of defenses all season long? As the players got set to return for the third quarter, Tommy put his arm around Jax. Four points! Stedman usually scores that while lacing up his sneakers. Did someone slip a four-leaf clover into your cornflakes or something? Jax was offended. You just said I was shutting him down. I've got to stick up for my man, Tommy reasoned. But you and I both know you're not that good. He's checking you out like he's facing LeBron. I don't get it, Jax confessed. He should be chewing me up and spitting me out. Instead, he's making me look good. He's kind of staring at you. Tommy observed. I guess he's in ugly. Thanks a lot. Hey, I'm down with it, Tommy added quickly. If it keeps Stedman off the board, you could be Miss America for all I care. The sharpshooter's coach escorted the star to get involved in the offense. And Rodney responded, shooting more and driving to the hoop. When he did, it seemed so natural and effortless that Jax couldn't help wondering why the leading scorer wasn't doing it on every possession. Jax couldn't stop Rodney Stedman at full speed. No one could. Not in the Gotham League, anyway. Maybe you're not as scared as I thought, Jax said with a chagrin smile. Rodney peered back in perplexity, as if trying to solve an especially baffling puzzle. Whether the MVP was frightened or not, something was slowing him down. He didn't break double figures until well into the fourth quarter. By then, the Chargers' confidence in their ability to compete could not have been higher. Avoiding, avoiding a blowout was no longer their prime concern. Winning was a real possibility. Okay, guys, Coach Knapp urged as they entered the last two minutes with a 63-62 lead. Just play our game and we'll leave this building champions. But in basketball, a one-point advantage is a paper-thin cushion. Rodney scored on a 10-foot jumper to retake the lead. The Chargers responded, but number double zero struck again, upping his point total to 14. Sharp shooters were ahead by one, maybe even worse. The MVP finally seemed to be heating up. What are you doing, man? Tommy hissed. Why'd you let him score? 
That's the way I always play, Jax panted. It's before that didn't make sense. Coach Knapp's face was crimson. Somebody do something. Sure, Shot's defense tightened, and for a moment it seemed as if the clock was going to run out as the Chargers passed the ball in a circle in search of an open look at the hoop. Shoot! howled the coach. The scream startled Gus into action. He put up a desperation shot that ricocheted off the hand in his face, wobbled in a graceless arc, kissed the backboard, and dropped through the hoop. 67-66 chargers. Exactly five seconds remained on the clock. With no timeouts remaining, Rodney Stedman took the inbound pass and headed up the court, the winning score in his hands. In an instant, Jack knew there would be no pass. All season, the sharpshooters had succeeded by putting their fate in the hands of Dumber Double Zero, and that's exactly what they were going to do tonight. The clock ticked down. Four, three, two. A step past the foul line, Rodney pulled up for the shot. Left in the dust, a half step behind his man, Jax knew there was only one way to stop him. He left his feet and hurled himself into the shooter just as the time went to zero. If this had been football, it would have been a textbook tackle. This was not football. Foul! The scorekeeper put 0.1 seconds back on the clock and Rodney was awarded two free throws. The Chargers were devastated. It had been the only possible move, but it was doomed to failure. Not only was Rodney the league MVP, but he was also the free throw king. The first foul shot would tie the game, the second would win it. Number double zero took his place at the strike and prepared to crown his team champions. There was nothing Jax could do but take his place and watch the world end. Rodney cast him a glance as if to say, You gave it a good try, but it's over. And in that instant, of all times, the vision came. He saw himself standing in the lane next to the sharpshooter's center. Now? Why now? Was the prospect of losing so genuinely terrible? He shook his head to clear it and did the only thing left to him in this situation. Miss, he mumbled under his breath. Miss, the shot went up. There was a loud clunk as it struck the iron and bounced away. The gasp that came from both teams sucked all the air out of the community center. This changed everything. Now, the best sharpshooters could hope for was for overtime. And Rodney still had to hit a free throw for that to happen. Come on, miss, Jax whispered again. Miss, miss, miss. The last word came out so empathetically that everyone on the court, including Rodney, looked over at him. He flushed and mumbled, sorry. He hung his head, which was why he never saw it. Rodney Stedman, MVP, served up an air ball so far from the basket that it was barely in the arena. Final score, 67-66 in favor of the West Side Automotive Chargers, the new Gotham League champions. Parents and friends rushed the court. The bleachers emptied. Gatorade sprayed in all directions as the visitors dumped out their bottles over one another's heads. The celebration was Insanity, a howling blizzard of back slaps and high fives. Jax experienced it from two different perspectives. In one, he was right in the middle of everything, at the Chargers bench, leaping and screaming with his teammates and coaches. And then, in a flash, he saw himself at the center of the pandemonium, as if he wasn't part of it at all, but was watching from half-court. 
It wasn't just the vision that shocked him, but the hint of emotion that went along with it. Inside the bedlam, he was bubbling over with the pure joy of the greatest, most unlikely David versus Goliath victory in Gotham League history. So how come in his hallucination from a short distance away, he couldn't help feeling just a little bit bummed out about it? 